So let me start by introducing myself. I'm a software engineer at developer advocate at Dynatrace. Um, I really love uh, communities, conferences, like meeting people who also do code. Uh, I do a lot of Go, so um, I'm an organizer of GopherCon and also Women Who Go. Um, and when I'm not coding or, or being part of a community, I'm also sewing. Um, so I don't know, that's about me. Uh, another thing about me is that I really love debugging. Um, and I only found out recently that other people don't really love debugging, and that was kind of weird for me. Um, if, if you're like one of the crazy people that does love debugging, we have a support group, so you can join that. Um, <laughs> no, by the end of this talk, I hope everyone will love debugging, but basically that realization that like I'm strange for loving debugging um, made me decide to try to figure out why I love it and why other people don't. I don't think I was born different, which makes me love debugging. I think it's like something in how I approach it or how I do it. Um, and so I like went on a journey to try to figure that out. And so this talk is about that journey. Now, this whole story begins three years ago. Three years ago, I was an instructor in a course. I was teaching computer programming, specifically the C programming language. And it was basically to bring like complete juniors, kind of like a boot camp where like complete juniors after three months, they're like entry level position kind of. Um, it was really, really intense. Um, and as an instructor in the course, I was responsible for the syllabus and also giving a few lectures, uh, mainly in C. And what I realized was that out of 30 hours of lectures, only one was dedicated to debugging. And even that one hour was talking about like how to use a debugger and less about debugging techniques or practices, how to do it, what is even debugging. Um, no, it's just like, this is a debugger, you can add conditions, stuff like that. And this isn't really unique to the course that I was instructing. Um, basically, every boot camp or university course, online course, this is like a pretty good ratio. Um, sometimes they don't even talk about debugging at all. And that's kind of crazy. Now, this is a totally made up fact, but 50% of the time uh, we spend as developers is spent on debugging. I'm saying it's made up because I try to research it. Um, a lot of like sites told me it was like 80% or 90%, um, but None of those seem reliable since no one could agree on a number. So I, I say it's at least 50%. And that's pretty, like, it's, it's a pretty rational number, right? I mean, even when we're developing new features and not, like, explicitly uh, debugging a bug, we're still going back and debugging and when we develop something a little bit wrong or just when we want to make sure that we did something the right way. So we spend a lot of time debugging and, and this, like, disproportionate amount of time we spent debugging and teaching debugging is really, really weird. And when I think about why, I think these are like the main reasons for that. Now, the first is that we don't know how. We don't have this like one size fits all solution for debugging, right? It's not like do this, com uncomment comment out that code. It'll always work. We don't know. So, so we just kind of avoid it and stick to the things we do know, right? If I teach you how to write a for loop, it's going to work every single time. It's consistent. That's how code is. That's what we like as developers. And when we don't know something, we try to avoid it. Uh, the second reason we don't teach debugging that much is because it's based on intuition. Not only debugging intuition in general, like the longer you're a developer, the better debugger you're going to be, but also for the specific code base. If you know it well, if you've debugged it a lot, you'll be better at debugging it the next time. Um, the third point is that it's just not fun. It's not fun, not only like is debugging considered not fun in general, but also it's not fun to admit that we've made a mistake. It's not fun to admit that we need to stop and look at our code as if we don't know what's going on there. Um, it, it's just not fun, so why not avoid it? Um, the last reason is that simple code equals simple bugs. And when we're just learning to code, we're learning on simple code bases. We're not writing thousands of lines of code. These aren't huge applications that like tons of people are working on. And when that's the situation, we have simple bugs. And so we never even get that experience of trying to debug a complex uh, situation when we're just learning to code. Now I wanna share my take on these four reasons and why I think, like why these reasons actually led me to writing this talk and, and wanting to talk about it. I don't know how to debug. This is not, like I'm going to talk about a technique, that's the reason I'm here, but I'm not going to give you a solution that will always work. My technique that I'm going to show you is 
specifically for big bugs, first of all, for like the bugs that, takes we that take weeks or months. Um, and then other bugs, you'll kind of have to find your own way through that. The, the second thing is that debugging still needs intuition. I can't teach you intuition, but I do know that when we debug intentionally, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how, is like steps to debugging. And then once we're thinking about the steps, once we're taking those steps, we're debugging with so much more intention and we're noticing what we're doing. And then the next time we have a bug, we're going to be able to reflect back and say, hey, this is what I did last time. This is what worked. This is what didn't. And that's going to give us better intuition. Um, I do think debugging is fun. <laughs> I think I've already established that. Um, but also I think it's a matter of mindset. We're taught that debugging isn't fun or we're not taught debugging and so we assume it isn't fun. Um, and if we just approach it a little differently, if we kind of like fake it till you make it, I believe we can make it fun. Even more than that, um, a lot of being a developer is being a problem solver and we love solving problems. We love like, I don't know, design and architecture and, and what's the correct way to do this or the correct way to do that. And like debugging a bug is that same thing, right? Finding a problem and solving it. And if we come with that approach, we're going to love debugging. Like, if we think about it practically, like, kind of uh, detach all emotion from it, developers are supposed to love debugging. It's just another form of problem solving. Um, and as for the last point, I'm not, we're not uh, just learning to code, and so I'm not going to be talking about simple bugs. This is a technique for larger bugs. Great. So let's talk about what happens when we have a bug. So the flow of finding, solving a bug is, first of all, we have some sort of unexpected behavior. Something goes wrong. We try to figure out what's happening, why it's happening, where it's happening, and once we figure that out, we can fix it. Now, unexpected behavior does not mean necessarily that we have a bug. For instance, one thing that could happen is just incorrect use of our app. Now, this may still be an issue, right? For example, a UI UX issue. Um, it may be a bad response. For instance, if a user clicks, don't click me, we still don't want to crash their whole computer. Like it's not, like it might not be a bug per se, but it's still not good, unexpected behavior. Um, maybe something went terribly wrong. I'm guessing most of you know this screen. Now, if you see the screen, it does not necessarily mean you have a bug in your code. Sometimes it's just the system is a little whack and things happen. Now, uh, another unexpected behavior type thing is integration issues. If we have two programs communicating with each other, both programs can be completely right or correct or do what they're supposed to do, but they just have communication issues, right? Um, and so we have to work it out uh, through communication. And lastly, the last type of unexpected behavior is when expectation does not meet reality. And that's what I like to call a bug. Um, when we think something is going to happen and something else happens, that's when we need to figure out why it's happening and how we can solve it. So once we've kind of categorized that we are in fact looking at a bug, we get to the why, what, where. So that can be staring at the code, right? Just literally staring at the code, uh, reading all the logs, trying to reproduce, running through each line of code, just the things that we do as we're debugging. Um, maybe you have more techniques. And then we fix it. We find a way to fix, right? This is the like, easy step considered, right? Once we've found where the bug is, we find a way to fix, we write the code, maybe we add a test because we want to make sure it's not, it won't regress in the future. Um, and that's about it. But I like to think of this as a research-based flows flow. Now, the reason for that is that this whole flow is kind of looking at our code as if it's this mystery as if we're not the ones that wrote it. And we are, we are the ones that wrote this code. This is not a, uh, a debugging technique for code you didn't write, by the way. Um, so our code, we're kind of thinking, oh, our code is such a mystery, what's happening? How is this happening? No, we know exactly what's happening in our code. We know exactly what's supposed to happen. We know the lines of code that we wrote. Um, the st second part that makes this a research-based flow is that we didn't plan out our, um, debugging process. We just kind of dove into it. We kind of thought like, okay, I see this is the bug. Where could it possibly be? Probably in this area, probably in that area. And then just kind of started debugging. And the last uh, part of this research-based flow is that we're guessing randomly. We're not like making educated assumptions. We're kind of just like, okay, it's probably there. Wait, no, maybe it's there. Wait, I see something a little suspicious over there. I'll probably go over there. Um, this might include print debugging. I don't have anything against print debugging personally, but sometimes print debugging can mean you're not doing 
right. You're not debugging correctly. It can mean that you kind of just started and didn't think it out. And maybe if you stop, like it could be a good solution, especially when you're like debugging race conditions and stuff like that. But in general, print debugging, if you didn't plan on print debugging, it might be a good opportunity to say, wait, maybe there's a better way to do this. Now, I suggest something else. I suggest approach to debugging like writing a feature. And what that basically means is that the most annoying part about debugging is the uncertainty. Uncertainty. As I said, debugging isn't fun. And the reason it isn't fun is, it, is because it's stressful. We don't know what's happening. This is the code that rewrote, but sometimes how it's not doing what we told it to do. Um, we don't know where to look. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to debug. And once we take out that uncertainty and add a lot more certainty, it becomes a much, much less stressful situation. Now, this technique that I'm going to talk about isn't about taking all the uncertainty out. I can't just tell you where the bug is and how to solve it, but it is about planning each step of the way so that you're certain about what you need to be doing at this specific moment in time. And so instead of being stuck and staring at your code, you know what you're supposed to be doing and you know how to progress in the debugging process. So let's kind of break down what writing a feature even is. It starts with specification, goes on to planning, and then executing. Let's split specification down into getting all the information, which is understanding the task, any edge cases that might be, and um, any protocol that you need, right? If you're writing a program that communicates with another program, you're going to have to um, get to a protocol that you both agree on. And you're going to have a definition of done, right? I've completed this specific feature once this has been done, once this it exists. <coughs> now, for big features, we're probably going to split it down, right? We're not going to have one big definition of done. We're going to have multiple definitions of done and split it into smaller tasks. And once we've, we have that definition of done, we're going to start planning out the feature itself, which means which components are going to be in the feature. Which language are we going to use, if that's an option? Uh, what design patterns, what third-party libraries we're going to use. Basically, this is a lot of answering questions about how we're going to approach this. Now, the interesting part of this step is that usually we get to one specific conclusion, right? <coughs> Sorry. But... So usually we get to one specific conclusion, right? At the end, we're going to have one or, like, X design patterns we're going to use, but it's not going to be an open-ended question. But the thing is that we are usually going to think of more than one way to answer these um, questions. So we're going to say, for instance, I have these three design patterns. I want to use these two, but this is also an option. And we're going to talk about with people and kind of come to the conclusion what the best choice here is. Now, why it's interesting is that later on, if we find out that we didn't like get to the correct conclusion here, we'll go back and we'll fix that, right? If we decided not to use a design pattern and then later on we're like, wait, that would have been really good, we'll just go back and say, okay, we're going to use that design pattern. So this is kind of an iterative process over this specific step. A big part of planning is deadlines. Um, we're going to have multiple deadlines usually if it's like split into mo smaller tasks. And the interesting question is, what if I miss the deadline? Because Having deadlines is easy, but what happens if I miss it? And in my personal opinion, missing a deadline means it's time to reflect. It's time to reflect, um, like, the thing could be we just didn't give it enough time, right? Maybe the deadline was just too short. But it also could be maybe we took a too, too much of a complex approach. Or maybe we're using something we shouldn't be using. Maybe we should add more people to work on this together. So it's just a time to kind of ask, I should have done this by now, why haven't I? It's not like looking for anyone to blame, but it's just to, to kind of figure out how do I not miss that de next deadline and what should I do differently? The last step of planning is to set up your workspace. And that means an easy to run example, I like to call this like my one click way to reproduce or my one click way to uh, check out this feature. If it's not one click, and if I have to wait 10 seconds and run 30 apps on my computer, I'm never going to want to finish this feature. I'm never going to want to run this feature. Um, so don't do that. I want to have up-to-date code. Just make sure like I'm in a comfortable environment, both physically and um, technologically, digitally. Um, and once I'm all, I've done that, 
it's time to execute. And execute is pretty easy, right? We try to develop in iterations. I don't know about you guys. I'm not always the best with developing in iterations. But like when I say what we should do, then we should develop in iterations. Um, and we document as we code. Even if you think you don't document as you code, probably do, you probably do, even if it's just like a small document while you're writing like inside the code. Um, it's important because then when you go back, you know what you've done. Great. So we've written a feature, right? We've done all these steps and we've created a feature. Admittedly, this is like, for smaller features, I don't do all of this. This is like the most extreme, the mo most verbose way to do it. But I think it's important because later on we can kind of take out the steps that we don't really need. And I want to do the same exact thing when debugging a bug. So specification, planning, and executing. Specification. As with the feature, the first step is to get all the information. Is it even a bug? So sure, our user got an error, but that, does that mean we really do have a bug that we need to sit and debug? Um, is it happening consistently? Is it happening a lot? Is it happening more than once? These are all questions we need to ask and make sure we know before we start just debugging and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we're going to get logs, traces, metrics, anything we can from our app that's running. And we're going to try to figure out what environment it was running on, if that's like which browser or which um, operating system, just getting all the information that we can before we actually start doing anything like actively to debug this bug. <coughs> Once again, we want a definition of done. And a definition of done is interesting because if we can reproduce the bug, that's easy, right? We say, okay, we reproduce the bug. Once I have no, no longer have this bug, I'm done. But not, we don't always have reproduction, and we're going to have to find a different way to be able to say, I know I fixed that bug. And that's kind of annoying. I don't really have an answer for how to do that, but we have to do that before we start debugging. And I'm probably not the only one who's guilty of not always doing that. Like sometimes you just like, okay, I get an error. I'm, I'm right into it. I'm debugging. I'm doing all the things. Um, and like I find something and I fix it, but then I'm not even sure that I fixed the correct thing. Like, was this even a bug? So it's important to do that first of all. And once we've specified we have a bug, we know how we know what it means to fix it. Um, we're going to design. And when we were designing a feature, we were designing like the components and the code itself. But here we're going to design the process of debugging. And I like to ask myself, if I wanted to purposefully create this bug, how would I do that? And what that means is that I'm not asking, like, where in my code could it be? It kind of sounds similar, but it's not. I'm not asking where in my code it could be. I'm not asking what the hell's going on in my code. No, I'm saying, if I, I know my code. That's, like, that's, that's where I'm standing right now. That's what I know. I know my code. I know how it's supposed to work and what the flow is supposed to be. If I purposely wanted to make it do what it's doing. Where would I do, where would I add code? What would I change? What would I make different? And the funny thing is that like the first few answers I always have are really, really stupid. Um, sometimes they're just like, I would just delete this whole module. I would just like enter something wrong. Um, but like I can pretty easily cross those off and it doesn't take much like time or effort on my part to reach those conclusions. And so Doing that really helps me map out the possibilities. Now, with the answers to that question, I get multiple debugging vectors. And debugging vectors are just like, okay, this is a way to do that, or this is a way to do that. And I take those debugging vectors, or I take the most probable debugging vectors, and then I split them into pra practical milestones. A practical milestone is I can answer this question, yes or no. Okay? I know that this part of the code does this as expected. And, I, and while the debugging vector is take a look at this part of the code, a practical milestone is going to be this code does X or Y. Okay, so we know what the code is doing, and practical milestone is practical. Now, this really helps in the next step, which is deadlines. See, I always had a problem where I didn't know how to set a deadline for debugging. I was just like, this is a problem in my code. I don't know where the problem is. I obviously don't know how much time it's going to take to find it. But once I get these like practical milestones, it's pretty easy for me to map out, okay, to check if this is specific thing is working is going to take this much time. I know how to do that, it's going to be easy. And so I can give a deadline. And once again, the big question is, what if I miss the deadline and it could be I'm doing the wrong thing, I'm debugging the wrong way, I'm looking at the wrong uh, part of the code. Um, and it could mean that I'm 
sorry. It could mean that this debugging vector is too complex and another debugging vector would give me more efficient results. Um, set up your workspace is basically the same, but I can't uh, emphasize enough how much an easy to run example is important. Usually when we write a feature, it comes pretty naturally to do that, but when we are debugging a bug, once we get reproduction, we want to start working on it. But I really like encourage you to take those extra five, 10, 30 minutes and create a reproducible one-click solution because that's make, going to make the whole problem process much less tedious. If you don't like debugging, um, having to wait 10 seconds each time to like figure out if you've uh, fixed the bug or not is going to make it even more annoying. So this is so, so important to make it a much more fun experience. We're going to make sure we're on the relevant code version and the relevant environment. Um, and once again, we want a comfortable environment. Um, and so once we've done that, we have practical milestones, right? We know exactly what we're supposed to be doing at every single point in time, and we're going to start executing. So we're going to use the right tools. That's the first part of executing. Make sure, like, it can be print debugging. I do support print debugging. Um, but sometimes print debugging isn't enough, and we need to be using a debugger. We might need to even choose between debuggers, depends on which language you use. You might have a debugger that goes into more specific specificity, um, but is also harder to use. And maybe we don't even need a, de a debugger, but you need a profiler. You need to realize where all your memory is going or how, why uh, your CPU consumption is so high. So choose the right tool. Debugging iterations, this is the debugging take on development iterations. This is taking those practical milestones and using them. This is making sure you're making progress. Um, even with practical milestones, at some point you can be kind of stuck staring at your code. And staring at your code isn't bad. Staring at your code to make sure it's doing what you think it's doing is good. But you need to make sure that you're actually like either knocking down possible debugging vectors, saying, okay, this isn't this, I thought it could be, but it isn't, um, or you're actually getting closer to the bug. Because if you're not doing either of those, maybe you should just go back to that uh, planning stage and plan it out differently. You need to validate your assumptions while debugging. So this practical milestones um, like take is going to make sure that you're looking at a pretty small and specific part of your code. And once you're doing that, you can also make sure that your assumptions on that part of the code are correct. So this whole approach is saying you know what's going on in your code, but if I'm being honest for a second, we don't always know what's going on in our code. And so validating our assumptions while we're also debugging and looking for possible um, bug causes will cover both those bases and make it faster and also make us more confident because we're only doing it um, when we're actually in that part of the code and it's not our overall mindset when debugging. And the last part of debugging and iterations, which is super important, is to commit to Git. Um, I had this bug that I was debugging for a couple months, um, which is devastating. <laughs> um, but like when I, when I started, I didn't really commit to Git. I was just like, I was creating these reproductions and I was creating like a really cool way to print out all my variables and know like what's happening and stuff. And then I would move on to a different part of the code. Um, sometimes I get distracted like that. And so I would like, I didn't want those prints anymore. And so I could comment that out, them out, but sometimes I'd like regress to a different version and stuff like that. And they get lost. Um, even if I write them aside, like it's never good. Uh, and so I started committing to them to Git. And so I could go back in the versions or like look at the diff and only implement certain parts of it. And it was super helpful. And it's been my, um, my way to do it ever since. Like the second I start working on a bug, committing to Git is not expensive. Like planning it out might be expensive. Committing to Git, Git add, Git commit is super cheap and it's so worth it every single time. Um, the le next part is to document. When we're writing a feature, we're documenting while we code. Um, when we're debugging, it should be no different. That means debugging things that, uh, doc documenting things that worked. Okay, so we thought it would do this, it really did that. Deb documenting things that didn't work. Uh, we tried to do this, but it didn't work. Um, that's not enough to just say we tried this and it didn't work, we tried this and it did work. We also need to document why we tried it, why it didn't work, what our uh, conclusions from that are, what we think of that. and. Most importantly, our documentation needs to be consistent and clear. 
if it's consistent, it will be so much easier to look back on and understand why we did what we did and how that helps us in the future. Even more than that, when you have two bugs in the same area, having documented the way you uh, fix the previous bug or how you debug that previous bug is going to help you so much in the next time, especially if your documentation is consistent. And the next step is finding and fixing. And so this kind of leads you up to that point. I don't know how you can fix the bug, uh, but once you find that bug, you go back to the specification step, not the specification step in debugging, but the specification step in uh, writing a feature because you're done and you know what to do and it's writing some code. So these are all the steps. Once again, this is super detailed. This is a lot of effort to sometimes solve a really small bug. So what's really important for me is to plan proportionally. Don't, like, if you have a small bug, don't do all these steps. Don't sit around and be like, wait, am I using the right tool? No, just like start print debugging. But if you see that you've been doing this for a few hours or a couple of days, it might be time to go back and plan and actually do most of these steps. By the way, the executing step I always do, but that's also up to you. Uh, thank you so much. Also have fun <laughs> when debugging, it's important. Thank you. Uh, it's time for questions. We have three minutes. Anyone questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, one of the um, problems I've had with debugging things in the past is getting a reproducible result where the bug is intermittent, where the bug happens on my machine that is sometimes a rare machine that the developer doesn't have access to. Um, do you have any suggestions specifically to the reproduction step? Because like, Usually once you've found something, people will go after it, but until you can prove that it's actually happening over and over again, it's harder to get support for that. Yeah, I think, like, I don't know how to reproduce it better except for, like, make sure you get all the information you can, because, like, sometimes, a lot of times what I experience is that the problem lies in something super, like, esoteric, like, <coughs> You're just like on a call with a client and you're like, okay, what OS are you running on? And what like uh, limitations does your system have? And then they're like, oh yeah, and by the way, I use this library. And you're like, oh. And, and so sometimes it's those small things. And when you can't reproduce, I think using uh, observability uh, platforms is the best way because it's just going to help you. If the, if the client can reproduce it, the customer can reproduce it, then it's going to help you see what's happening in their uh, execution. This is an excellent talk. Um, I feel like it could be applied to a lot of different domains in the tech space because I come from the network engineering back. Uh, I, sorry, I come from the network engineering space, and then I see like debugging, trying to figure out what's going wrong. And quite honestly, it's the same set of methodologies and steps you would follow. Um, what would you do in situations where you think you've tried a solution, but you you don't know if you have or not? Like, so you're trying to debug an issue, and you've tried something tried like several other things and then you might have considered going back to something you might have tried earlier before. Do you think something like a branching strategy would help with tracking those changes or tracking the different ways you tried to debug? Definitely. I think that really goes, like it also goes into commit to git but also into documenting. Um, I had like, when, when I was debugging for two months, um, obviously I had a lot of going back and forth and like this isn't a linear process at all. And so... I would write, like, it wasn't, it was, I would just, like, write exactly what I was thinking, which sounds weird, but it was basically, like, it wasn't, like, I wasn't trying to formulate anything, right? It wasn't something that I thought would see, what anyone else would see. It was just, like, the way for me to remember, and that's what helped me be able to go back and make sure I did something or even try again when I, like, created some sort of environment to work with and retry that environment. Um, I think branching, if it comes to Git, is also very helpful for this, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have like a short one. Oh, <laughs> a big question. See, we humans are visual thinkers, like most part of it. So for coding, why is that there's not much visual debuggers? Like I want to see, see in 2D and 3D whatever the hell happening inside the computer. Like why doesn't they exist? I think it depends on which tools you're using. Like, there are tools that 
do give you that. I, I don't want to like plug my company, but like <laughs> we are an observability platform and I know that like it's something that we're really focusing on um, to give like developers a view of their code or their apps, if it's in Kubernetes, because we are at uh, KubeCon Rejects, um, and give that visual view. I think with code it's a little more difficult because it is text-based, but, but there are a lot of parts like components and stuff that you are able to create that graph with. Thank you, Jordan.